I took a carrot with me to work the other day, and I put it down on my desk, and then I didn't touch it. Not that I'm opposed to eating vegetables. To tell you the truth, I forgot all about the carrot until the next morning. When I came back to work and I found it exactly where I'd left it, <laughs> except it didn't look like the same carrot the next morning. It was limp and it was lifeless, and it had lost the crunchiness, which is what attracts you to a carrot, or me to a carrot. Now, I wasn't sure what I should do with my limp carrot. It seemed like a waste to throw it out, but I wasn't about to eat it either. So I decided to do what I do when I'm confronted with a problem which is too big for me. I decided to ignore it and see if it would go away. And darned if my little carrot didn't do its best to do just that. Over the next few days, it began to dry up every day. It shriveled up a little more until after a week, it was a wizened, dehydrated shadow of its former carrot self. And I thought to myself, I guess that's what happens to you when you sit around a third floor studio day after day. And then I thought, wait a minute, that's what I do day after day. <laughs> now, I don't know if you get out much. I know I don't get out much. But when I do, I've noticed that people are a lot more conscientious about drinking water than they used to be. Every second person you pass is carrying a water bottle these days. And up until I watched that little carrot shrivel up, I figured that I absorbed all the water I needed when I showered in the morning. <laughs> Now I thought if this poor little mummified carrot's life had any meaning, it was to tell me that it was high time for me to get aboard the water wagon. So have you ever tried to drink eight cups of water in a day? <laughs> I tried for two weeks and found out that like staying on a diet and following a modest exercise program and not watching cheap talk television, it was just one more in a long list of righteous ambitions destined to humiliate me and send me like a school child to swim in the sorry pool of self-loathing. <laughs> It's one thing to dream about representing your country in the Olympics and have to face the fact that at 50 you can't run a mile in under eight minutes, let alone under four. But it's a failure of an altogether different magnitude to find out you cannot drink eight glasses of water in a day, <laughs> even when you set your mind to it. So after two weeks, I decided that I was going to do this if it killed me. And I bought myself one of those fancy water bottles ones you see the kids carrying all the time these days. I got myself a, a ripstop nylon holster so my bottle would always be within reach. I set my watch to beep every hour. And I promised myself that I was going to empty that water bottle every time my watch beeped if it was the last thing I did. Almost was. <laughs> by noon, by noon on the first day, I was, I was well on my way. By noon, I was driving along the 401 highway, heading for an appointment, and I was feeling pretty pumped up. I had, I'd been up since 7 o'clock, and so far my watch had beeped five times, and I'd emptied my water bottle each time it beeped. Don't get ahead of me, ma'am. <laughs> Buddhists would tell you to stay in the present moment. It was noon, I only had three more bottles to go. And that's when it was suddenly brought to my attention that the reason I hadn't been drinking eight glasses of water a day was simple. Man's body isn't designed to drink eight glasses of water a day. The notion struck me with the force of a fire hose. <laughs> I looked out at the window. I looked at the eight lanes of traffic whizzing around me, at the concrete retaining walls, the narrow shoulders, and I realized I was in serious trouble. <laughs> I shifted in my seat uncomfortably and I began to, to wonder just how many glasses of water a man's bladder, mine, could hold. <laughs> and what actually happened when there was no room left. I was beginning to feel as if there hadn't been a redundancy built in. I felt a pulsing, stabbing pain. And I left the world of rational thought. As I drove along the highway, my eyes began to narrow and my tongue began to flip in and out of my mouth and I entered the world of instinctive behavior. I embraced my lesser reptile self, and all I knew was that I had to get off the highway right away, but even my lizard self could see there were no exits. So have you ever tried to cross your legs while you're driving a car? This is not something you should do at 130 kilometers an hour. 
And then somewhere deep in my prehistoric brain, I realized that no matter how fast I drove, I wasn't going to find an exit in time. I realized I needed to find something to pee into or I was going to have an accident, and I'm not talking automotive. <laughs> so I looked around the car, and all I could see was the water bottle on the seat behind me. This is where I catch up to you. But the water bottle was full. So I drank it. Water went straight to my bladder. Now, if you think driving a car and talking on a cell phone is dangerous, you don't know anything. I didn't care. I had the empty bottle. So I filled it. But I wasn't empty, if you get my drift. By then, I didn't care anymore. I pulled over. Now, this is something you see people doing all the time in the country. You see a car pulled over on the edge of the road. You see a, a man or a woman walking into the woods at the edge of the road, holding a child's hand. Child's a decoy. <laughs> Well, there were no woods to walk into where I was. It was just me and all of these cars and the shoulder and a concrete wall and the eight lanes of traffic, about a thousand cars a minute. Now, there is a certain pose that a man with my problem has to assume if he is about to resolve his problem. And I don't care who you are, you cannot disguise this pose. You can stand by the edge of the road and reach into your pocket and pull out your cell phone and pretend you're talking on the phone. But when it comes to the moment of truth, everyone is going to know exactly what you're doing. So I stood beside my parked car and I'm bouncing from one foot to the other and I thought to myself, if I was wearing a dress, this would be a lot easier. If only I had a dress on and different plumbing, I could manage this. If I didn't have to aim and shoot, if I could just shoot. I could stand by the roadside and pretend I was looking at birds. And at 110 kilometers an hour, who would notice? <laughs> but I wasn't wearing a dress. And then I knew what I was going to do. The solution came to me. I would open the hood of the car. I'd lean against the bonnet like I was checking the water level. <laughs> and while I did that, while I was hidden behind the hood, I would quickly finish what it was that I had started. So I hopped behind the hood and I got into position and just when I was getting to the crucial moment, well, you know what happens when you have a breakdown on the edge of the highway. Some Anglican stops to help you. So I'm standing there all ready to let go, and this guy pulls over, and he gets out of his car, and he walks up to me. He says, what's the problem? Without thinking, I say, I think it's flooded. And this guy says, I'll stick around until it dries out. And that's when my watch beeped. And when I heard my watch beep, you know what I did. I reached for the bottle. And that's when I realized I had to get out of there. I, I slammed the hood shut and I jumped into my car and I waved at the guy and I drove off knowing there, well, there had to be a Tim Horton somewhere close by. And as I left, I'm thinking to myself, if only I'd listened to my mother, she always told me to eat my vegetables, and if I'd only eaten that little carrot, none of this would have happened. Thank you very much. <laughs>